favorite question people like to ask me whenever I travel is, why did I decide to become an advocate for criminal justice reform? And maybe more importantly, how did I become an advocate for criminal justice reform? And the short answer to that is, I didn't. I didn't want to do this work. Who wants to be the poster girl for eyewitness ID gone bad, right? Who wants to be the person to stand up and say, it was me and I failed? In the summer of 2000, I was on my deck, dressed in a blue and white bathrobe with my hair up in a towel. The BBC was actually setting up a film crew because we were getting ready to do a documentary titled The Human Face, which would be narrated by John Cleese. Now, I was really excited about this week, not because the BBC was on my deck, but because my triplets, who were 10 years old, were gone for the first time in 10 years. They were in overnight camp, all of them, for a week. <laughs> I had made this grand list of things I wanted to do, these things that I haven't been able to do for 10 years. The first one was drink a hot cup of coffee without microwaving it 12,000 times. <laughs> the second was to sit down in a chair and eat my meal with a fork <laughs> when it was still hot. The third thing I wanted to do was take a bath alone. <laughs> but my phone rang. It was a man by the name of Dick Burr. He said, Ms. Thompson, I am a public defender in Houston, Texas. I represent a death row inmate by the name of Gary Graham. Gary Graham is going to be executed at the end of June of 2000. Mr. Burr, I am busy, and, um, and I don't know what this has to do with me. He said, well, we're going to do a press conference. We'd like to know if you'd come down and tell your story. To which I replied, Mr. Burr, you have to understand something. I'm a supporter of the death penalty. I believe that the death penalty works. He said, well, are you in favor of executing innocent people, though? And I said, well, no, of course not. So he said, well, I'm going to overnight the case file to you. If you would, take some time, read it. If you think there's a claim of innocence, would you consider coming? There went my list. The case file came to me. I stayed up most of the night reading it, and I was shocked. Gary Graham's case hinged on a single eyewitness who saw the shooter for two to three seconds from her rearview mirror, 10 o'clock at night, 75 feet away. Needless to say, I hopped on a plane and I headed to Texas. I was greeted by a lovely man by the name of Rob Warden, who worked at the Center on Wrongful Conditions out of Northwestern University in Chicago. He took me to the hotel, checked me in, said, would you do me a favor, go and get freshened up, call your family, let them know you're here, okay, and meet us downstairs for dinner. I've never given up a free meal yet, and I wasn't going to do it this day. <laughs> I went to my room, freshened up, called home, went downstairs to the restaurant, and was meted by 12 men and women, none of who I knew, black and white, from different parts of the country. We began to exchange pleasantries, ordering sweet tea, red wine, steak, salmon. Rob Warden came into the room and said, if each one of you would just stand up for a few moments and tell us who you are, introduce yourselves, why are you here? It's this beautiful, huge, barrel-chested man from Cambridge, Maryland. He stands up and he says, my name is Kirk Bloodsworth. I was sentenced to die by the gas chamber in Maryland for the rape and murder of a nine-year-old little girl. DNA proved that I didn't do it. Five eyewitnesses said I did. This is horrible. I mean, innocent people on death row in the United States of America? How could this be? Not in my country. The second person was Joyce Ann Brown, this lovely African-American woman. She was sentenced to life in prison for the murder and attempted murder of a shopkeeper and his wife. Her time card showed that she had been at work at the time of the killing, but an eyewitness said it was her. She spent 16 years in the women's correctional facility before she was proved to be innocent. Dennis Williams, one of the Ford Height Four, 17 years on death row, eyewitness identification. Tim Durham was sentenced to 3,220 years for the rape of a 12-year-old, even though his receipts showed he was three states away at a golf tournament with his father. An eyewitness put him there. Herman Atkins, 12 years. Perry Cobb. 
all of it went around the table until they came to me and they said, now Jennifer, you stand up and tell them who you are. No thanks, I said. I think this is a really bad idea. I mean, because these people have steak knives. And the next thing I know, they're going to kill me. I cannot stand up. I cannot tell them who I am. Yes, you can. You really can, Jennifer. And I stood up and I began to cry. My name is Jennifer Thompson. I'm from Winston-Salem, North Carolina, at the age of 22, in a small town called Elon College, North Carolina. I was a senior going into the last year of college. I had worked really hard. I was, I was making great grades. I was a 4.0 GPA student. I was going to get married. I was working two jobs because I wanted to pay my own bills. I lived alone in my own little apartment, and I was proud of where I was. I had worked hard to get to this point in my life. On July 29th of 1984, I'd gone to bed, and at 3 a.m., I was awakened by a brush against my left arm, a sound that, that was like feet shuffling on my carpet. As I struggled to open my eyes, I looked to the left of my bed and noticed the top of someone's head that was crouched and moving. I said, who is that? Who's there? And at that moment, a man jumped up on my bed, straddled my body. As I screamed, he covered my mouth with a gloved hand and put a knife to the left side of my throat and said, shut up or I'll kill you. In that moment, as the brain tries to make logic out of illogic, you start thinking to yourself, what is the possibility here that I can actually process through my brain? This has got to be a robbery. This has got to be someone who's been trying to steal. And I've, I've, I've shocked him. I've interrupted to the robbery. I'll offer him everything I have, my car, my, my credit card, my cash, everything, anything, please. Please don't hurt me. I promise I won't call the police. And he looked at me and said, I don't want your money. And that's when I knew what was going to happen to me. I knew. I knew that he was going to rape me. But what I didn't know was, was I going to die? Was this the last moment I have on this planet? Was this the last thing my eyes would see? Was this the last touch my skin will ever feel? And when I die, will it be quick? Will it just be over? Or will I know it? Will I feel it? Will I be in pain? And how long will it take before I die? I started thinking to myself, I, I need to tell my father that I love him. I need to tell my mother, thank you for everything you've ever done for me. I started picturing what my dad was going to see when he came to the morgue to identify my body and would have to look at it and say, that's her, that's our daughter, but she didn't look like that. Those were the thoughts that went through my mind. And then I made a decision. I won't die here. I won't die like this. I may die but it won't be on my back. And I will know who you are. I will look in your face. I will look at you when you rape me. I will remember everything about you. I will burn it in my brain. I will never forget who you are. Over the next 20 minutes, as he assaulted me and raped me and began to talk to me and tell me things, I would look in his eyes. I would remember his eyebrows. I would pay attention to his nose. I would look at his hairline. I would look for, for scars, tattoos, piercings, anything or everything that he couldn't alter later on because I would live and I would see you rot in hell for what you're doing to me. I was able to talk him off of me telling him that if he would just take the knife out of the apartment and drop the knife on the hood of my car, I think I might be able to relax a little bit. He fell for it, and the power had just shifted ever so slightly. I 
pulled a blanket off the edge of my bed. I wrapped it around my body because I needed to stand close enough to him to figure out how tall was this man? How much did he weigh? What was he wearing? A navy blue shirt with white stripes on the sleeves, khaki fatigue pants, canvas boat shoes. It all was important. It all meant I was going to live. He pretended to drop the knife out of the door and he came back in and grabbed me and said, let's go. And I said, um, I have to go to the bathroom. Would you just give me a second, please? And I turned the light on as I walked past him as he yelled at me to turn the light off. But again, it was a second in the light that was important for me. It was important, and I went into the bathroom and I began to pray. I didn't know a next plan. I didn't know how I was going to get out of this. I couldn't fit through the bathroom. The bathroom window was too small, and there was a big drop to the bottom of the cellar. But he had told me he'd come through my kitchen. If I could get to the kitchen, if I could get to the back door, maybe, just maybe, it was still open. And his way in would be my way out. I came out of the bathroom. Could I have a drink of water first? Yeah, make me a drink and we'll have a party, he said to me. I said, okay, I, I can do that. And he turned on the stereo looking for 98.7 KISS FM because we were going to have a party. As I went into the kitchen and I turned the light on, knowing that the light was going to give me time, it would give me space, it would give me distance, it would give me 10 feet, it would give me five seconds, but I needed that as I went into the kitchen and began to make noise with the water running and, and the cabinet doors opening and shutting, and I pulled my blanket tight, and I prayed, and I ran. It was raining. The grass had become slippery. I didn't know where to go. I had on a blanket. I looked over my right shoulder, and he was coming out after me, and I knew I'd made him angry, and he was going to kill me. So I did the only thing that made any sense to me was to run to light, get to the light, I thought, get to the light. I found a carport banging on the door, screaming, please let me in, and I've just been right, please let me in, he's behind me. And the man who lived there looked through the glass and screamed right back at me. But his wife behind him said, my God, she's a student at the school, I see her every day on campus. Let her in, and she had been a professor. I fainted. They called the police. They had canines that tried to pick up his scent, but it was quickly washed away, and I'd be taken to the hospital where I would have a rape kit done. Because my body had now become the crime scene, and the evidence was on me and in me, and it had to be collected. But it would be there that I learned that he had just left my place and raped another woman. And I hated this man with a blind rage. I wanted to find this man. He's a menace to society. So working with a police artist, I began to give a description. It began in the newspaper, and it led to a suspect by the name of Ronald Cotton. I was able to pick Ronald Cotton out of a physical lineup and a photo lineup. Ronald Cotton would go to trial. January of 1985, State versus Cotton. Two weeks of my life listening to lie after lie, lie after lie. But I knew who had raped me, and it was Ronald Cotton. The jury deliberated four hours. Ronald Cotton would be guilty of all charges, and he'd be sentenced to life in 54 years. And we went back to the district attorney's office, and we had champagne. We toasted the criminal justice system because it worked for me, the victim. Every night of my life, I would pray for his death. Not just death, but a painful death. Every night. March of 1995. My children were five years old. I'd gotten a phone call from Mike Galden, who needed to come and talk to me about this thing called DNA. Ronald Cotton was still claiming he was innocent, that there was some guy by the name of Bobby Poole running around prison claiming that he had actually committed these crimes. But I consent to a DNA test. The DNA test was run. Three months later, they came back to my home, stood in my kitchen, and they said, Jennifer, the DNA doesn't belong to Ronald Cotton. It belongs to a man by the name of Bobby Poole. What do you say to something like that? How do you reconcile that? Ronald Cotton would be exonerated June 30th, 1995. It would take me two years before I could find the courage to go and meet this man. He came into the room in a church not far from where I'd been raped 13 years before. As I sat there and looked at him, I started to cry, and I said, Ronald, 
if I spent every minute of every hour for the rest of my life telling you I'm sorry for what happened, for what I did, could you ever forgive me? Could you ever find it in your heart to forgive me? And Ronald did the one thing I didn't expect, and he took my hands and he cried. And he said, Jennifer, I forgave you years ago. I'm not angry at you. I want you to have a good life. I want you to move on and be happy. And for the first time in 13 years, I started to heal. My heart and my spirit began to heal. And how strange it was that the man I had prayed to die would be the man to teach me to live. Ronald gave me back my life that day. I had changed. My world had shifted. June 2000, the next day I was at the press conference, and I looked at these 12 new friends of mine, and I looked at them in the face, and I said, I don't know how the victims from these cases feel, but from the bottom of my heart, I'm so sorry for what happened to you. And this lovely man stood up, and he looked at me, and he said, Jennifer, you're the first person to ever tell me you're sorry. I think I can start to heal now. My worldview shifted in Houston, Texas in June of 2000. I met two new, very dear friends, Kirk and Joyce Ann Brown, who would teach me about loss, who would become my, my mentors. In the spring of 2010, I was in Rochester, New York. I went to a prison where nine young men on the day they turn 18, will be transferred to adult prisons for the rest of their lives. I sat there and I told them my story. At the end of it, a young man came up to me and he said, would you hug me? I held him in my arms and he asked me this question. He said, I have a daughter. How do I become a good father? I know I'm going to prison for the rest of my life, but what do I do? And I explained to him that you can still be a good father, teach her what a good man looks like, and I told him, you know, my future depends on the decisions you make. And he looked at me and he said, no one ever told me I even had a future. And again, my world had shifted. My world had changed. And so maybe what the question is, is not waiting on the world to change, but perhaps it is what are we waiting for and who are we waiting on? And maybe the answer is, the time is now, and it is you. Thank you.